Can Apple's new Apple Silicon MacBooks live up to its hype? And Sony's PlayStation 5 or Microsoft's Xbox Series X, whose cuisine will reign supreme. Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband, changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. Hi there. Welcome back to Vertical Hold Behind the Tech News, the weekly podcast where we sneak across the state borders to catch up with Australia's leading technology journalists to get the stories behind the news of the week. I'm Adam Turner, and I'm joined, as always, by Alex Kidman, a man who's reserving his final judgment on the next-gen consoles until there's a decent port of the original Bomberman. Alex, which other 8-bit classics need to come to the latest consoles before they're a sound investment? Look, everyone is going to expect me to say bubble bubble, so I'm going to shock people and say bubble bubble. (laughs) That does not come as a surprise at all. Of course, it's also been a massive week for Apple lovers, and we're joined by News Corp National Technology Editor Jen Dudley-Nicholson as the HomePod minis hit the shelves and Apple takes the wraps off its shiny new Macs, which dump Intel processors in favor of Apple Silicon. Jen, welcome back to the show, and how are you coping with the lack of sleep after another huge week in tech? I think it is completely unfair for Apple to keep launching awesome stuff um, and and making us get up and watch it when I can't get access to caffeinated gummy bears right now. It's just not right. Yeah, we'll have to do something about that. You know Tim Cook. You know people make something happen. (laughs) I mean, I I could tweet him, I guess. Um, I'm not really – I mean, he'd he'd have my address, so I'll see. (laughs) Well, we'll we'll pull a few strings and see what we can do. We have a lot of pull at vertical hold with Tim. You know, we don't like to brag about it, but, you know. (laughs) We'll chat with Jen in a minute, but first, I caught up with Alice Clark from the Sydney Morning Herald and Alex Walker from Kotaku because it's a huge week in console gaming as well, with Sony's PlayStation 5 and Microsoft's Xbox Series X and Xbox Series S finally in the hands of consumers. Okay, the entirely unfair question to throw to both of you, if you were thrown into a Saw-style scenario where you had to pick a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox, which one are you going to choose in order to save your life? Because I recognise it's a totally unfair question this early on in the life cycle. Uh, Alice, you go first. Okay, well, clearly I'm going to die because I <laughs> cannot choose. Um, I love, the th- it depends. Am I still getting free games every week or do I have to pay for them myself? I, I think if I'm going to threaten your life, I can throw a few free games into the deal. Okay, so if I still had unlimited free games... I think I would actually go with the PlayStation just because of the DualSense controller uh, and the experience that that brings because like I'm playing NBA 2K21 on it now and I'm going between the Xbox and the PlayStation on it and the PlayStation is genuinely offering me a better experience. Like when my little guy who I forgot to upgrade his stamina on gets tired, which is all the time, that trigger gets really hard to push and it just feels good. But if I had to pay for my own games, Xbox is a no-brainer because Game Pass is easily the best thing at the moment. And Mr. Walker, your survival scenario, apart from knocking me on the head so none of this happens? Oh, I was thinking about this earlier today and there's a longer answer to the question, but I think if... It's funny because if you're an Xbox user or you're you're selling Xbox, right, you talk about Xbox Game Pass and, and you talk about like how all your existing accessories can come over and look at how many games they're going to have coming up and you've got things like the you know the bethesda acquisition and the fact that you know for the last decade like you're microsoft you've been sitting on like literally like 40 to 80 billion dollars of cash like you could just back up the oslotto truck and buy whoever you want so why does playstation still continue to just outsell the living hell out of xbox right like especially now in a scenario where, and and we can see from our, what we do in the media, the PlayStation is just slapping Xbox all over the the park. And I think it's comes down to largely if you don't know, if you're not in the space, or you're not a gamer, you ask someone who you know for a recommendation, like what do you like? You trust them. All, same way a lot of all three of us have with tech, right? Like if somebody doesn't know, is the next iPhone good? You know. You know, should I get, you know, this for a computer or whatever it might be? 
And so if you talk to a lot of people who spend a lot of time playing games, they look for the thing that's going to be most interesting to them. And I think the PlayStation 5 is a more interesting console. Whereas what the Xbox does is it effectively brings the benefits of PC gaming to Xbox, both in kind of like the idea of like the the way that Xbox Game Pass is expanded, but also things like how they're doing like boosted frame rates, especially a lot of the backward compatibility stuff is, if you think about it, the benefits you would get of having a better gaming PC, right? But now they're more formalized. Whereas PlayStation's looking at it more like a, from an individual escapist experience level. Um, I'm not as high on the adaptive triggers as a lot of other people are. I actually think they're going to get super annoying. And in my experience, I've turned them off a lot of the times, but it's the haptic feedback that goes all throughout the controller that I think is absolutely banger. And that's, you pick up an Xbox controller, you don't get that. You get a little bit extra rumble, you get a little bit more feedback in the triggers, but you don't get it through the whole thing. Certainly don't get the adaptive triggers if that's your thing. And so I think what, I'm getting from a game I'm playing at the moment and I'm playing some games like concurrently on Xbox and PlayStation, they are more tactile to play on the PS5. And because I've been playing games for like 30 years, that's more interesting to me and that's where I want to spend my time. Mm. And also from an exclusives perspective, look, you will not find a bigger Forza Horizon fan than me. But even I have to admit, even with all the money Microsoft has thrown PlayStation still just has the better exclusives. And maybe that'll change next year with Bethesda and everything else has got that's going on. But The Last of Us Part 2, I am still broken from that. Uh, Spider-Man, like I replayed uh, The Last Spider-Man before Miles Morales, and that was a world that I could get completely lost in with gameplay that was incredible. And I haven't seen anything like that on Xbox. Well, when you don't have any games to launch with, really all you've got is backwards compatibility. Is it true they don't have any? I mean, aren't there like one or two for each console? Yeah, there's some. Miles Morales Spider-Man on PS4 is amazing, as is Astro's Playroom. Uh, I'm now addicted to this slightly better version of NBA 2K21. Yakuza Like a Dragon is pretty good. Uh, Dirt 5 also existed. Uh, Tetris Effect Connected is really good if you want to have a seizure of some kind or want to remember what having drugs is like. But there's no real... There's not, as no, there's not enough. There's not as many games. Demon Souls as well, which oh, yeah, Demon Souls. just hit today. Uh, Alex, would you would you actually... I, I, it's, to make my own position clear, I've had a bit of time with an Xbox Series X, none with a PlayStation 5, but would you agree there's not enough? Because this period in a launch... Of a console is always a bit like this. Yeah, I, I think it's. I mean, you look back to previous launches. Like, what did the Switch have? It had one, two Switch, and it had Breath of the Wild and Snipper Clips. And I think it was a save by the fact that Breath of the Wild, like, was engrossing as it was. But generally, most console launches and go all the way back. There's usually like one big game that they expect people to invest their way into and then they know the others will come maybe in a month, maybe two months, maybe three months. Um, And it's generally because, like, consoles are really an early access deal. Um, They can't give dev kits out to developers, like, two years in advance. Uh, And they also have to kind of wait and see where people's creativity takes them, right? Like, it's not just a case of pushing out the consoles, here you go, okay, we can have like 20 PS5 games or 20 Xbox Series X games at launch. It's a case of this technology needs to be built for everyone because it's not just being applied to consoles. The AMD hardware is also coming across to PC. So you've got things like open source standards and how do we do things like ray tracing on a broader level? How do we do things like AI-based upscaling, which it's kind of there on PC is technically now there on consoles too, but like, we don't know, again, we don't know what that implementation looks like. And all, so all of that takes time. So I think the way that the backward compatibility works now is a lot better because there are some genuine tangible benefits that you get that you wouldn't have gotten uh, in previous backward compatibility, you know, eras. Like I go back and play like the second Star Wars pod racer, 
right? What is it? Race's Revenge. If I go, go and load that up on my PS4 Pro, I get bugger all benefit from it. Like it works. It works smoothly enough, but it's not going to look any nicer, really. It's not going to run any faster. Xbox has done like a huge amount of work in the previous generation with some of their back compat stuff for like 360 games like Codor, um, Red Dead Redemption and things like that. Now with at least the Xbox Series X, these things run at better frame rates. These things run with much better texture filtering. Like it actually, it's now adding something into the experience that makes it genuinely worthwhile going back and playing some of these games. Um, Particularly if, you know, you're looking at games like sort of like Fallout, which could be like super janky Mm. and actually still really janky, but like you have a much better experience playing them this time around. Um, I think things like Yakuza, um tetris effect demon souls is a huge one for a lot of people um like alice said spider-man miles morales um i think miles is a better spider-man than um peter parker for my money he's more interesting that seems to be a very very common theme yeah yeah well i mean like he's got more character like and there's also more happening in his world so it's kind of like what we've got is pretty good and even some of the third party stuff like you can pay play yakuza like a dragon on the ps5 now but it's only the PS4 version. If you do play it on Xbox Series X, it's much nicer and much smoother. So there is a genif- genuine benefit to doing that. So I think, all right, things aren't too bad. I should say, yeah, it is very true that the previous generations have not had that many launch titles. And I'm not saying that they don't have games now as some kind of jab. It is also that there are fewer games than we originally expected because 2020 has been a like hell. And so we don't have Forza Motorsport. We don't have the usual launch good driving titles. Mm. And backwards compatibility and being able to say that now you can play all the games you liked before or never got around to before and have them be better is a much bigger selling point for the first two years anyway. You've got stuff like PS Plus Collection, which even though like most of the games in that aren't actually better on the PS5, there's going to be, there's some really good stuff in there that people might have missed, like, Persona 5 or, like, Monster Hunter World. Like, they're big, good titles. Mm. Um, Xbox Game Pass, like, from a a launch perspective or, like, even just, like, the retail perspective, if you're saying talking to, like, the casual crowd or, like, a a parent who just wants to come in and buy something for a household, that's really good. Um, I feel like it'll be a slightly different conversation in a month's time when Cyberpunk comes out because I feel like Cyberpunk is that GTA Breath of the Wild kind of attention grabbing. This is what we want from a next gen console launch. Um, and also, that we'll also have Ubisoft's, um, what is it, Immortals Phoenix Rising? Jesus, that's a yeah. terrible name. Um, it is not a great name. It gets worse every time they change <laughs> yeah. it. But that's also kind of looking like a, a surprisingly really solid game in its own right. So I think when those land a little bit, I think it'll be a, a little healthier which will help because a lot of people aren't going to even get their consoles till december anyway mm. i was under the impression and i could be 100 percent wrong on this that some of the version of cyberpunk 2077 that was coming out was the xbox one slash ps4 version with the proper next gen version not due till next year am i off base on that um yeah so it it will run on the next gen consoles um there will be some improvements from like the ssd um, from just mm. the ability to deal with data streaming in generally, um, so more stability and some texture filtering. But you're right, like it's not going to have like ray tracing on the next gen consoles, or it's it might not run at the same high frame rate that say like Yakuza does um, on the Xbox Series X. Uh, but you know that's that's fine. It's also going to. They did also notice when. Um, the PC version is also going to get upgraded when that PS5, Xbox Series X um, content patch, whatever they're going to call it, goes out in 2021. So, you know, I think it's having played it earlier this year, like it's still going to feel like a next-gen game to a lot of people. So I don't think that's people are going to be too bothered by it, especially since there are still a lot of games that don't run at those super high frame rates now anyway. Okay, one of the things that did somewhat surprise me firing up the Xbox Series X was how familiar that user interface looked. Like it is, it's 
yeah, and I don't mean this in a negative way, it's just an Xbox interface. Have they done much on the Sony side in terms of the general UI, the shopping experience? Is there anything there that's going to either entice or infuriate people, do you think? It's kind. It's a lot like the PS4, but it looks completely different. So everything is basically where you expect it to be in the way you expect it to be there, but it looks nicer. It looks pr- more premium. The pictures are smaller. The details are more black. The letters are more rounded. Uh, going between the PS4 and the PS5, the PS4 now feels like outdated junk and the PS5 now feels futuristic and wonderful and that's exactly what i wanted from a new console as as a retro gamer i I feel like i should be offended on the ps4's part but (laughs) i wouldn't count it as properly retro yet it's time will come give it another week yeah yeah a week Uh, maybe a week and a half (laughs) Uh, alex has that been your experience with the ps5 as well yeah, I think uh, the way that they've redesigned the UI without redesigning the UI. Uh, you know, if you actually go back and look at a lot of the features that they added into the PS4's UI over the course of its life cycle, there's a lot of downgrades. Like, there's actually just a lot of functional things that either aren't there um, or are, are hidden behind, like, more prompts or, or buttons. Something as simple as finding hidden trophies is now a few extra button prompts than it used to be. If you wanted to copy over like your save data in the PS4, they would um, obviously because you get to a point where you might have like hundreds of saves or cloud saves for a game and you want to download it onto a drive to put onto another console, which they recommend you do if you're upgrading from PS4 to PS5. Okay, sounds good. Um, But what if you don't want like 300 games worth of save data? What if you only want seven? Well, on the PS5, you've got to scrub down alphabetically until you find every single one of those games because they didn't bother copying over the text input box that they added into the PS4. So there's kind of, there's rush things on that front, but I think like the more systematic thing that kind of shits me off a lot, and this is an Xbox problem too, uh, is the fact that you look at something like Steam. Steam has done a lot of work over the last several years and especially in the last two years on their algorithms, and then work into something like machine learning. And the reason why they do that is simple. It's a really good business decision. Um, If you use machine learning and algorithms and incorporate the immense amount of player data, and remember, like we're talking on Sony's side, you're talking like over 110 million consoles sold, however many accounts that factors in, all the playtime, what those accounts bought, the games that they did finish, the games that they didn't finish, Like, that's an awful amount of information that you can use to, say, feed them a game that is similar to either category or playtime or certain characteristics to the game they just finished, as opposed to advertising them a game that's in their library. Both both consoles do this. They're they're incredibly dumb. They're very, like, they rely on manual curation on a regional basis rather than factoring anything particularly intelligent about what the user might want to play next, and that's bad for them, right? Like, it, And it's also especially really, really, really bad from a developer standpoint because one of the things that devs hated towards the end of the PS4 and the Xbox One era was the fact that they just could not get any attach rate on either of those consoles. Xbox is saving grace as they had Game Pass, which took away the whole, I don't want to take a plunge on this because it's maybe a little, you know, priced a little too much for what I think an indie game should be, Right. Game Pass removes that. Whereas the Switch, like Indies, had a lot of success there because people wanted to pick up a game uh, of the console to play a game and they would find a lot of different games they wouldn't know about. You go to PlayStation now, you're going to see either games that you already have in your library like Demon's Souls or Spider-Man because they're the only next-gen games, right? Or you're going to see other next-gen games that aren't out. It's not going to say, hey, maybe try this older one that's like what you just played, or maybe try this other one because your friends are playing it. You can find some sort of version of that, but they've buried it so deep. And that's when AAA development is getting more expensive and the price of games hasn't really changed since 2005, Sony and Microsoft need to rely on smaller developers and those double A games to fill that void of content. And the way the stores are set up, it's just not going to get surfaced to users. That's bad for the users. It's bad for them as platform holders. It shits the developers off. And honestly, the amount of work that those companies have done on AI and machine learning in other areas of their business 
it is actually kind of staggering that they haven't sorted this out on the console platforms yet. Like it, it just boggles me. It is definitely about time that they got on that. Like a Netflix recommendation system, even in uh, Game Pass, the recommendation system is better than in the actual Xbox store. And I already own Game Pass. They're not getting any more money from me by, by playing that. Whereas if they're recommending me stuff elsewhere, yeah, you're completely right. Well, speaking of actual regional curation, the other bit of news that uh, they announced the morning that we're recording this that genuinely surprised me because I did not see this coming was that they would finally actually start running xCloud here. Uh, Alex, can you do a quick 30-second rundown of what xCloud is for the people playing at home? So effectively either using the ability of um, the Xbox um, ecosystem. So that's largely their Azure data centers that Microsoft use uh, or using the power of your Xbox within your own internal network to stream a game to, you know, in this case, it's going to be Android for Australia, but they are trying to make it still work on iOS and, you know, mobiles and tablets, basically. So it's game streaming, that thing that they've been talking about overseas for years, PlayStation Now and NVIDIA and Antstream for those of us in the retro scene, that we never seem to get in Australia, but we're getting it. Why are we getting it now? Because they have a shiny new console out that is sold out everywhere, but they still want you to play. Like Xbox really actually doesn't care if you get their new console. They don't care if you buy an Xbox One, but they want you to pay a monthly subscription to fee to them and if you can't get game pass why not get xcloud stream to your phone or tablet wherever you are it's a good onboarding system to get uh like mums and dads are like oh i don't really want to spend 500 dollars on a new console but i will spend 15 dollars a month so little jane can play uh her demon souls on her phone and then see if she actually likes it for long enough not going to get in trouble at school for playing that in any way, shape, or form. I'm sure. <laughs> Look, the stuff you can get away with at business. school. Yeah, it fits Microsoft business perfectly. True, true. Have they actually announced with with XCloud elsewhere? Have they announced any Xbox Series X stuff for that, or is this still currently only Xbox One slash PC content that we're talking about? Yeah, I, I think it's just Game Pass. Like, there's nothing exclusive in terms of like just Xbox Series X. Because that that would also be quite weird because their thing is um, uniformity across the generations. Like if you've got an Xbox One, everything that's coming out to Xbox Series X or S, you can play on your old Xbox One. And it is important to differentiate that xCloud is different from Xbox console streaming. So they've had console streaming on consoles for ages. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think last year it launched on Android, but time is getting a little bit fuzzy. And this year it was on iPhone and it works really well far better than PlayStation Now ever did, um, and that it actually works. Whereas xCloud, you don't have to own an Xbox in any way. You don't have to own the game. You just need to have some kind of mobile device or tablet that you can play games on. Actually, just a fun, mm-hmm. here's a fun thought exercise for both of you. Can you tell me what was the last character from an Xbox exclusive that you fell in love with? And then how long it's been since you had that same experience on PlayStation? Uh, so last, <laughs> what's the name of uh, Kira? Kira from Forza Horizon. I love that woman. I've never seen her face, but she's always sounds so friendly and enthusiastic. I, I think of Kira and I think of a character I fell in love with on Xbox. On PlayStation, God, I, I love Miles Morales. I wish I loved Ellie more than I did. I wish they hadn't made Ellie evil because that plays into a whole lot of stereotypes that are very close to my heart. But I love Dina. So, yeah, Miles would be PlayStation and Kira on Xbox. What about you? And for me, it would be, in fact, the first thing I loaded up on an Xbox Series X but they don't actually have a name. So I don't know if this counts, but the uh, the nameless grunts that you get in uh, EDF 2017, because that game is still awesome. Uh, but on the PlayStation, actually, while I haven't played Miles Morales, the new one, uh, the version of Miles that they had in that previous game was just so well realised that, uh, yeah. that I'd probably go him as well. And I think that's for me, it's like the distance of time between those characters you connect with. 
Mm. That's what kind of defines the big difference between the two platform holders for me. I think it might switch in a couple of years once everyone starts firing because content acquisition takes a while to go. Mm. But like, you know, Alice was saying there, like that's a gap of like six months, right? Not even that between like Miles Morales and like talking about Ellie and what's happening to Dana and, you know, what's happening in all of The Last of Us. Whereas like for a lot of people, that character for Xbox, well, it would have been Master Chief, but he's mm. not here, is he? So who's the next one? Uh, who's going to be in the next Fable? I figure there's going to be someone in that. Playground Games is really good. I'll do something good with that. But, yeah, Xbox is not the place you go for characters, which is sad because it feels like they should be. Like with their Gaming for Everyone program. Actually, no, Tyler. Tyler from Tell Me Why. He's the last um, Xbox character I fell in love with. That was only a couple months ago. Oh, yeah, that yeah. was September, wasn't it? Sorry, Start 20... of September. 2020 has been Every a long, Every month this year has year. been a decade. Uh, but yeah, no, Tyler, that was pretty recent. <sighs> so thank you so much for your time. Um, Alice, now is your time to promote your social media, where you appear online, and as is our topic of the month, your choice for the best biscuit. Ooh, okay. So social media, you can find me on Twitter at AliceDKC. Uh, online generally, you can read me on the Agent SMH websites. I've also done some stuff for Kotaku and Lifehacker and Gizmodo recently. I also have a regular column in Biteside and the Herald Sun every week. Uh, and my favorite biscuit. Look, my wife makes this amazing chocolate chip rye cookie with sourdough. And she knows, normally uses very fancy dark chocolate for hers, but she puts the Cadbury stuff in mine and it's just it's the perfect chewy texture it's the nice caramelized uh chocolate and there's a little bit of salt in there and the rye and the sourdough you can pretend it's almost healthy but it's absolutely not it's amazing highly recommend I, I I'm, I'm I'm salivating as we speak uh, Mr Walker exactly the same questions but presumably not the same biscuit answer <laughs> no I'm gonna diverge as I always do um you can find me on at Kotaku Australia. You can find me on Twitter at Dippy Zuka, D I W P I Z U K A. Um, I'm generally also doing a lot of the replies on um, Twitter and Facebook too. So that'll be me. Uh, in terms of biscuit, like I'm, I'm going to flex. I got really into scones because I spent some time um, down at my parents a, a little while uh, ago. American biscuits. And yeah, well, I've done an Australian way, not, not their awful, shitty implementation, but proper lump soft on the inside not like rock hard on the outside but just like with a nice little bit of crunch good amount of pumpkin so it's like super moist some whipped cream some good jam uh i can i'm gonna make some pumpkin scones tomorrow i think that sounds so good like it yeah. turned out all right so jen apple silicon macbooks are here what's the big deal is it worth getting excited about Look, I think if you're in the market for one of these, then it's definitely exciting that they're they're finally out and you can future-proof yourself. Um, and some of the claims that they're talking about are quite exciting too because um, especially on the 13-inch the MacBook Pro, 20-hour battery life doesn't sound terrible to me. It used to be that mm. 10 hours was all-day battery life, and so I guess this is two all days. Well, Apple's discovered that there's 24 hours in a day. <laughs> huge, huge news and sadly i've got to be up for all of them depends if you're working in an apple factory or not because there may be more than 24 hours in a day Ooh, in that case burn. but look call me mr cynical and ma many would lots of laptop makers make that kind of 20 plus hour battery claim it doesn't always live up to real world testing and i think the big story here is maybe not hey there are macbooks although there are it's, hey, they've got this M1 chip. And, and Jen, you mentioned this. They're making some really big competitive claims about it. But have they really backed that up with a lot of data around what they mean? Well, it's not entirely clear, but we are talking about devices that nobody's really had hands-on time with except for Apple because, yeah, tyrannies of distance in 2020, we can't actually go and, and touch them even. Um, and they also they all look the same, so it's really all about the data at this at this point and and what they can do in terms of 
GPU and CPU and oh my goodness, I've had the geekiest talks this week um, and, and really getting into, yeah, uh, computing architecture, which I mean, everybody wants to talk about. Um, what, what they're saying though, is that potentially these are much faster than their previous models. So in particular, the, there are three models, as you say. So there's, um, there's the new MacBook Pro, um, the MacBook Air, which they both have the same chip and the Mac mini, which they all have the same chip. So um, it's interesting to me that the, on like when you compare them on paper, um, they look quite similar. And so the big difference is cooling. Um, so, and then if you get, you know, some of their claims they were talking about were, you know, up to five times the graphics performance, that's a big jump. I want to see that jump. And I particularly want to see that jump when I'm editing video and editing photos, because I think that could be amazing. But we do have to wait and see if that plays out. My inner cynic says that uh, that five times graphics performance, though, that's five times better than what you could get on integrated, not five times better than discrete. But as you say, we've sort of, we've, we've got to wait and see. There is, that, there is that weird difference, though. There's one MacBook Air model, the entry-level one, which is a slightly different M1 chip because the others are eight-core chips. This one, eight-core CPU, eight-core GPU. This one is eight-core, I think it's eight-core GPU, but only seven-core CPU. It's slightly lower powered. We still don't even know what that means. All right, so Alex, just getting back to basics though, with, with the M1 chip, it's different to what you'd normally get in a notebook because it is a SOC, a system on a chip. What does that mean and what are the benefits? So system on a chip architecture is nothing new. If you have a smartphone, you have something which has an SOC in it. Um, and the whole idea here is most people are probably aware that a computer is made up of a bunch of different functional little units. So your processing unit, your graphics unit, that kind of stuff. And historically, those were all separate things at a certain point of time, a certain build. They were literally physical different boards. And if you build PC desktops, you can still, of course, do that. System on a chip shrinks this all down into a single chip, hence system on a chip. And the uh, there are two real advantages for SOC. One is efficiency, because just at a, at a very, very gross base level, if you think about a CPU having to send some data to a graphics unit, say, Put a, put a pixel on a screen, it's got to send that. It's got to travel through the motherboard. It's got to do that. The graphics chip has to say, all right, I've done it. It has to send that back to the CPU to say, it's been done. If it's all in the same chip, there's basically no travel time. So you can be more efficient both in the way you send that data around and in your power usage as well. Thus the long battery life. In theory, yes. But it gets, I mean, it gets a lot more complicated than that. Um, and it's it's very much a question of how you design it and build it and how it works. And what's really interesting here, and we knew this back at WWDC, is the fact that Apple is saying we're going to be going kind of dual band with this for a while. They're not totally dumping Intel, although I was surprised at how many Apple Silicon MacBooks and Mac devices they launched. They're not totally dropping Intel. And Big Sur, the new version of Mac OS, which will actually be available or should be available by the time people are listening to this, will actually support both. And they've said that they'll support Intel or that they'll they'll be releasing Intel-based Macs of some stripe for, I believe, Jen, I think it's I think they said something like the next two years or so. Yeah, so the transition period is two years where they'll go from Intel to completely um, Apple Silicon, whether that's an M1 chip or something else that comes down the line. Um, however, they have said that they will support Intel-based Macs for longer than that. So we've been through this kind of transition before, haven't we, Jen, when they moved from, I want to say, power PC to Intel, which yeah, opened up all star. kinds of things. <laughs> it, it opened up all kinds of things. Like suddenly you could run Windows native on the hardware, so you've got things like boot camp and stuff like that. What sort of changes are we going to see with a move away from Intel? And based on the last transition, what kind of ride do you think it's going to be for people who have still got Intel Macs? Yeah, look, I hope it's going to be an, an easy ride. And Apple have created, um, obviously, they've been spruiking this since WWDC in June. Um, they've created a few different types of, of software programs. One, to make sure that people can actually, you know, recode their apps to move them across to uh, the new architecture. And also um, something called Rosetta 2, um, which is so that you can actually, you can use uh, existing Intel programs on your Mac. Um, as for the other way around, uh, 
it, it could be a bit tricky. Like at some point they will have to choose to stop supporting Intel programs. Um, and I understand it's it's also, it, they may actually not be able to use um, boot camp because it, it won't be, it, you can't use it, can you? Like it's it's not going to support it. So the weird thing with boot camp is for Big Sur, so this is the new version of Mac OS, if you've got an Intel-based Mac, yes, you will be able to use boot camp. If you've got an Apple Silicon-based Mac, no, you won't, which basically means its days are numbered, although yeah. whether that's that two-year period or I think it was about five years, about five Mac OS upgrades after they uh, after they shifted away from PowerPC where they said, actually, we're not really going to do the original Rosetta PowerPC stuff anymore. So there was a decent kind of shelf life for those Intel Macs at least. But, Jen, the other thing I guess that Apple Silicon brings in is a few – things that you couldn't do on a Mac that you could do on an iPhone or an iPad. Yeah, so potentially we're going to see a lot more um, iOS apps. Um, so so now we're going to see the transition because they're all using um, Apple chips, they're all using system on a chip, it's all the same architecture. Um, people should be able to um, bring their their apps across essentially eat more easily to the Mac and obviously not those ones that involve like a accelerometer or some sort of GPS chip because you will be um, – I just wave my Mac around. What are you talking about? I want to go running with my MacBook. Yeah, I go jogging with it all the time. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, so maybe you're not going to use necessarily Fitbit, for example, um, and and track your steps with your iMac. Um, but you'll be able to get a lot more access to um, to those sorts of those sorts of apps on your computer, which could be quite useful, and it could really open the the Macs a Mac App Store from what we've seen um, to. I guess, yeah, a lot more, a lot more features essentially. There was a fear for a while. People were worried that Apple was dumbing down Mac OS and turning it in basically MacBooks into glorified iPads. Do you think that this will feed into that fear, or has that kind of died away if people come to terms with it? I think that people have other things to be considering. Like in in all of this, like normally when there's a new Mac release, you'll see something about, and why doesn't it have a touchscreen? And there actually weren't that many people this time around who were saying, why doesn't it have a touchscreen? And I really expected that. So maybe it's something that people aren't necessarily thinking about now because they're too busy worrying about, you know, are uh, am I going to get the five times, um, you know, upgrade in, in GPU and am I going to be able to actually get 20 hours of battery life and there be a, therefore be able to um, yeah, stay up into the night watching the next Apple conference without having to find a power plug? I guess the other thing that it gains from getting those iOS apps, though, is it's a bit of a buffer in a way because we don't know how well Rosetta 2 is going to work with, his ex- his, with existing apps. Yeah. So they've said, I think, was it Adobe Lightroom? I think they said there will be a, 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 an Apple Silicon version of that pretty quickly in Photoshop early next year. But those big apps that people rely on, you don't want to hit a Rosetta wall of, gee, everything else runs five times faster, this runs five times slower. But being able to maybe run the iOS versions or iPad OS versions might help to you know, make people a bit more comfortable, to keep people productive in the meantime. Absolutely. And it's an interesting kind of, you know, when, when do you move um, dilemma? Because I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, when does this new chip come out? Because I don't want to buy something and it not be up to date and then, you know, have some sort of artificial, you know, expiry date put on it by, you know, buying the wrong chip inside my computer. And at the same time, you've got people now going, oh, well, do I wait to, to see, you know, what sort of hurdles there are with Rosetta 2 and, and, you know, being able to access the apps I actually need to? Do I want to wait till next year to be able to access Photoshop, for example, while Adobe optimizes it? And so it's, look, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Um, probably wait and see the reviews to see um, how, how all of these claims shake out. But it's very promising. And I think it's, one of those transition periods that Apple kind of has to make, just the same as I'm still ruining the day that they, they left the 30-pin plug behind, really. <laughs> I think that's just you, Jen, but uh, people it, at least don't have be. to wait all that long. <laughs> I mean, they are actually out next week, which is surprisingly rapid. Absolutely. And I wasn't necessarily expecting that. Like, obviously, we knew that the new chips were coming. Um, and they'd Apple had initially said at WWDC that they would bring out a computer with these chips by the end of the year. We didn't know it was going to be three. And then we didn't know, oh, yeah, surprise, you can order them right now and they'll be out next week. So someone has been doing some amazing work in factories and is apparently not that affected by COVID. 
It presumably helps that they didn't seemingly change the physical design in any way, shape or form. These look exactly like their prior models, basically, don't they? They do. They have... And I don't know how I mean how much how much people you know buy their laptops for these reasons, but there are a few changes um, inside the the MacBook Pro. So it does have um, more microphones this time because you know, everybody's very interested in microphones and and being heard and not being on mute this year, for example. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. And they also made some changes in terms of I think the software behind the FaceTime cameras, so that you can actually look clearer whether you want to or not on video chats. Um, at least, you know, make make yourself look better in terms of lighting, which a lot of people, including myself, have problems with. But in terms of the, the outside, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. You're, people aren't going to know that you're a cool kid with an M1 chip. You have to put a sticker on it. There's got to be some way for people to know that you've got the cool new Mac. How else are you going to get mugged for it when you're out running? Look, I'd have hoped so. <laughs> <laughs> outside? What? <laughs> Speaking of cool new things from Apple, the new HomePod Minis also hit the shelves this week. Now, Jen, you and I have had some hands-on time with them. These little pint-sized ones are only 150 bucks. Uh, are you impressed? I am impressed, actually. Um, I like the initial HomePod, and I know that uh, so, you know some people didn't want to purchase it because it was a huge sum of money. Um, it delivered a lot of good sound for that money, and these ones, I mean, the sound doesn't quite match them but they're affordable and they're easy to set up and they do what it says on the label. So at the time when Apple announced them, I thought they would sell a lot of them. Um, And I still think that Apple is going to sell a lot of these things because the sound is probably better than I'd expect of a device of that size. And it's, it's not a full size HomePod, but it still does a really good job. Yeah. I was surprised where that drew that line. It was, as you say, it was a bit more budget than I expected. I thought it would be, you know, your 250 instead of your 150. But also that small size means they do actually compromise a little bit on sound quality because this thing is, it's the size of a thermal detonator for Star Wars fans. It's a sphere that'll fit in your hand. <laughs> you know, when, um, oh, Alex, you know, the, the, when Leia, know prete- exactly when Leia about, pretends for, to be the, the bounty hunter. Yeah. For, for the more technically inclined, um, and I have argued this before, it's the new Amazon Echo Dot, but with an Apple sticker on it. So it's a big sphere that would fit in your hand, basically, that looks like a magic eight ball. But because it's so small, it only has one speaker driver in it, whereas the the for the same price, you can get the new Google Nest Audio or the Amazon Echo fourth gen, which have a couple of speakers inside them. And in return, you get better sound, which can, if you're fussy, you can definitely hear the difference listening to the same track on a HomePod and a, a Google, uh, sorry, a HomePod mini and a Google Nest Audio. So I am i didn't think they'd go that budget, but because it's so small and cheap, maybe they will sell a million of them. But in the past, like with iPhones and everything else, they don't want to make dirt cheap ones. It seems like a different direction to me. Were you, were you, are you surprised they've gone that low down? Yeah, look, I was surprised they they went sort of that cheap and and cute. And as you say, like there's there's one speaker driver inside here. Um, I think that $150 from like an an analyst who I talked to was saying that's pretty much the sweet spot for a gifting present. And so that's why I think they're going to sell so many of these before Christmas. And uh, I think one of the the big criticisms they had when they put out the initial HomePod, because this is a 2.5 kilo speaker, like it's it's kind Mm. of a beast and the sound is great from it. But it was very heavy and it was very expensive. And so now they've responded to that that feedback essentially and they've done the opposite. And it's it's quite inexpensive in terms of smart speakers and it's certainly very small. Um, so you can put one of these things just about anywhere, including beside your TV. I was interested that, you know, this can connect up to your Apple TV and service speakers there because I think that could potentially be um, a use that we haven't seen necessarily being promoted by by. Amazon and and by Google. Well, that's interesting, actually. So I'm I'm the non cool kid in the room here because the HomePod Mini is the only one I haven't played with, but that puts it in that middle space because the fourth gen Echo does audio in out. You can you can plug that into other things if you like. The Nest, of course, doesn't. Yeah, but I will, that little HomePod Mini, I think, is too small to get decent sound for a television. I, I think you'd be better off putting that even into a dirt cheap sound bar would still maybe sound better than that. Mm. But it seems to be, it's almost like they want to convince you, here's one more reason to own one, even though you may never do it. This thing is so versatile that please give us your money. Isn't the point really just seeing off, well, especially in the States, Amazon, but Google, just in terms of smart home controls, though? 
if you want the good audio, if you're Apple, buy the big HomePod. That definitely does play into it. And I think, um, I mean, Apple has had um, a bit of an infrastructure around smart home before. Um, you know, they, they've got, you know, HomeKit. They've, they've got the, the labels on, on all of the devices where, and it's supposed to just work. So you can you can scan the label on the side of it and it will all connect up. I think that is part of it in, in selling that whole idea of the smart home so that you can have these speakers in more rooms than you would the giant home pod certainly and you can tell your lights to come on and and you automate your home and those sorts of things and one thing that um, I think that people should definitely familiarize themselves with is intercom <laughs> um, and it's this new feature so that you can basically yell at people in your house yeah. in all kinds of different rooms and I've been using a similar thing with uh, Google home speakers and and been using you know the broadcast feature they call it so that you can wake people up in different rooms and I love it please give me more ways that I can yell at people in my house. It's awesome. Has your kid discovered it though or has he been banned from using it? Because I imagine <laughs> that doesn't go both ways. Well, it just depends where you actually install these devices in the first place. <laughs> he did discover that you could add things to a shopping list in Google. However, it didn't go anywhere, but it has the weirdest stuff on it. Well, that just about wraps up another massive episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Alice and Alex for taking time out of their busy gaming schedules to join us for the show. And thanks, of course, to Jen for joining us to talk everything Apple. Now, Jen, this is your moment to tell the world about where they can find your work, where they can find you on social media, and, of course, this year's theme, your choice for the best biscuit 2020. Ah, oh, the pressure is on. Biscuits. Look, I'm, I'm fond of an Anzac biscuit, although it has to be done just right. You can find me probably chatting about this on social media at, at Jen Dudley on Twitter. Um, and as for my work, it's all over the place at, at News Corp uh, Mastheads, uh, including news.com.au. Sounds awesome. And Anzac is a very patriotic choice of you, Jen. Thank you. And uh, as always, you can catch us online at verticalhold.au on Twitter, at verticalhold.com.au on the web, or on the Vertical Hold Facebook page. And thanks again for joining us for another huge week in tech. If you know someone who's into Apple gear, if you know someone who's into gaming, recommend that they have a listen to the podcast and help us spread the good word. Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Aussie Broadband, changing the game with their award-winning network and Australian-based support. That wasn't bad for a guy who can't improv. He did the improv! <laughs> it can be done! The prophecy! Ad-lib. <laughs>